Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. It's a beautiful day in Jerusalem, and I'm sitting in the study with, in, in Yerushalayim, in his study, with Rabbi Natan Lopez Cardoza, whom I have been following, actually, for many years, uh, different essays that he's written, which have been compiled into a book, Jewish Law as Rebellion, a plea for religious authenticity and halachic courage. And I saw Rabbi Cordoza at Limud a couple of weeks ago at the UK. You guys know that I was there. And uh, something clicked. And I said, I need, I need to interview him after all this time. So first of all, thank you so much, Rabbi Cordoza, for making time for me today. It was all pleasure. It was a great pleasure. Um, in reading the book, which I got a, a, the copy of already, uh, a few things stand out. One of them is, is your background. Perhaps tell my listeners a little bit about your, your personal story. Okay. Uh, I was born in 1946 in Amsterdam. I am a child of a mixed marriage. My father was Jewish. My mother was not Jewish. They married just before the... Second World War started and the Germans came to Holland and uh, my mother took in the whole family of my father, hit them. Uh, very similar story to the Anna Frank story and managed to save his family, his mother and his brothers and sister and their spouses. And uh, except for one person I, after whom I'm called, Nathan, Nico, who uh, did not dare to hide, left for Germany and never came back. I was born in 1946. Uh, my father was a very proud Jew. And I think that uh, because he met my mother uh, in a Jewish business in Amsterdam, uh, who had lost her parents and lived among the Jews and felt totally Jewish, so he married her without completely realizing that she was actually not Jewish. That came out much later. So uh, I was born 46 uh, as a non-Jewish child, half Jewish. And uh, because my father all the time emphasized his pride in his Jewishness, I felt also a strong pride for this and uh, started to get interested in the Jewish tradition via a highly unusual Jew who lived in Amsterdam in the 17th century, and that was Baruch Spinoza, the man who walked out on the Jewish tradition and even got a ban on his head. And uh, my father was a great admirer of his, and we used to study pieces of Spinoza when we were still young. And the critique which Spinoza had on the Jewish tradition is actually the reason why I got in interested in the Jewish tradition, because I was wondering what was he attacking. So I started to read and I got fascinated with the Jewish tradition, with the Torah and the whole uh, world around it. And uh, so I decided when I was 16 years old that I wanted to become fully Jewish. I went to the chief rabbi of the Portuguese Spanish synagogue. We are Portuguese Spanish Jews. We came from Spain, Portugal in the 17th century to Amsterdam. And uh, I asked him if he could convert me. And he said, yes, but you have to learn a lot, which I did. And then when I was 16 years old, I made the step, which was the greatest step besides marrying my wife, which I ever made in my life. And since that time, I'm fully involved in Jewish education. I've published a lot. I've been speaking around the world, uh, lecture tours in universities, in Jewish communities, I'm publishing a lot of books, articles, which I still do till this very day. Today, I'm 71 years old, a few years later, and uh, blessed with uh, lots of grandchildren, great-grandchildren, nearly all of them living in uh, Jerusalem. I went to Yeshiva at Talmudic High School or Talmudic School where I learned for about 12 years uh, when I was very much part of what is called the ultra-Orthodox world, but then realized that there was more to Judaism than what that world was offering me. So I went my own way, built my own philosophy, my own theology, if that's the right word, and became a little controversial. and. Uh, because of that, I uh, get invited by many unusual places, universities, Jewish communities, secular communities, non-Jewish communities to speak about how I see the Jewish tradition. And not only 
as far as Jews are concerned, but also as far as non-Jews are concerned, how they also could have part in this. It seems that there are a lot of people, or many people, who are unhappy with Judaism, who feel that it doesn't speak to them anymore, so they grew up in a religious home and are leaving it, or finding ways to cha- to try and change Judaism into something maybe that it isn't, like liberalism becomes Judaism for them. Um, you are a rebel, I would say. Is that okay to say it yes. that way? It's the title of your yes. book. Um, in that you do not want to throw out the baby with the bathwater because of your tremendous love for Judaism. And it comes through the book that halacha, the Jewish law, you feel is too rigid and needs to be to go back to what it once was? How, how would you explain this? Yes, I think what happened with the Jewish tradition, and specifically with halakha, Jewish law, which covers every part of our lives, public and private, um, got too much codified over the years and therefore uh, too much strict about matters when in fact we are able to use all sources which are much more flexible. Uh, the reason for that, in short, is that while the Jews had to live in uh, Galut, in the diaspora, uh, they had to make sure that they would survive the diaspora as a minority among a majority, a lot of anti-Semitism. So they built very high walls around them, spiritual ghettos, basically, so to be able to survive which required that they had to live in conformity. They had to do more or less all the same things and because that was the only way how they could create the strengths and the power to overcome these incredible problems which uh, they were confronted with. So what happened was that therefore the rabbis started to codify Jewish law, did away with a lot of minority opinions, different views and made it standard, standardized it. And that took away the spirituality of it, the beauty of its many uh, facets, of its many colors, of its many forms of music, I would say, and therefore became in many ways very defensive. And what I'm saying is that now that uh, Jewish people came back to their homeland, we don't need to be so defensive anymore. We can allow Jewish law again to develop in a natural way, which it always was doing until the moment we went to the diaspora, when it became artificial, basically. But now that we are back, we have again the opportunity to go back to where we left it off and where we are able now to develop it in a spontaneous way, no doubt with halacha, with Jewish law. But Jewish law is a very, very wide and a very flexible concept and very fluid in many ways. And therefore, the codification which worked in the diaspora is the wrong thing now for Jews living in the land of Israel and perhaps for Jews anywhere in the world because our situation has radically changed with the establishment of the state of Israel. So I'm arguing and fighting for the idea, let's do away with the codification, let this halakha develop in the way it had to develop and that is organic in a way that it is able to do what it was not able to do for the last 2000 years. I would say it was for a long time in a waiting mode, couldn't do anything else, but now we have the opportunity to go back to where we left it off and to develop it properly. And that means a lot of spontaneity. It means a lot of spiritual options, a lot of inspiration, a lot of music, and a lot of colors, which we have somehow forgotten over these 2000 years. And therefore we have lost a lot of people who could have been involved in this if they would have known what the real Jewish tradition is all about. So what the state of Israel gave us now is physical security from the threat of annihilation of all the years. But it's also presented as some of the challenges where I think the the freedom that you're talking about can come. For example, we now have a society. We can have a Jewish society, not just Jews in their homes or in their little communities living in a bigger society. But there are many questions that have to be dealt with um, 
Jewish questions that we didn't have to deal with before. For example, it's something that's in the news now all the time. Should stores be open on Shabbat? Should there be public transportation? How do people want in a Jewish country where Shabbat is the day off, but if somebody says, I want to go to the beach on Shabbat, or I want to go visit someone who lives a little further away, that's what Shabbat is for me. Do you, now, Shabbat has been, the, if we already started with Shabbat, Shabbat has been one of the big platforms, let's say, for defining if somebody lives a, I hate using the word religious, but lives an observant life or not. Shabbat, let's say, and Kashrut are the two big things. So how how here is a society, can we play with Shabbat? I know that near where I live, the Tzomet Institute and Alon Shvut, the ones who developed the Shabbat elevators, and all kinds of other things where you are technically not breaking Shabbat by building something or creating a fire, but perhaps the spirit of Shabbat is different. If we have Shabbat cars, so is it taking us away from what Shabbat means? So these are, these are enormous questions that we didn't have the luxury of dealing with for a long time. And you're saying that the way Judaism is structured now, where the rabbinate is structured now, where the people who are deciding what is halakha are not dealing with this question properly? Indeed, I believe that they're not dealing with it properly. I don't think they read their own times correctly. Uh, they don't understand uh, what is now required. I think the, the issue which you are touching on is the question about democracy versus the Jewish tradition. And that is a very delicate uh, issue. Uh, one of the uh, uh, situations which indeed has been developed because of that is something like Shabbat. Now, if you ask me about Shabbat, I would say like this, without speaking about pure halachic criteria, I think psychologically it is wrong to make Shabbat also into a weekday by opening up shops and uh, all sorts of different uh, centers where people can enjoy themselves with a form of consumerism. Shabbat is a day, first of all, for family, for family activities, for learning, for singing together. But our consumerism has become so enormously important in our eyes that therefore the value system which the Shabbat stands for gets pushed aside. So I am not in favor of opening shops on Shabbat, uh, but I'm also not open, oh, very much in favor of opening on Sunday uh, the shops in America or for that reason anywhere else. A nation needs one day off where they have something else on their mind and realize that just buying things and consumerism uh, is not the ultimate reason why we are existing and what is the meaning of life. So that is the meaning of Shabbat or for the Christians on Sunday. Losing that out is a big mistake. On the other side, there are obviously issues that you have to give people the opportunity to do whatever they like to do. So that is where the tension in the state of Israel really lies. Now, there is really within the Jewish tradition, this is very fascinating, a concept of democracy, which was for the first time discussed by the great Rabbeinu Nisim, the Ram, as he's called in Hebrew, who lived many hundreds of years ago, who said that if you look very carefully in the Torah and the Bible, you will find that there are two legal systems there. There is the rabbinical system, and there is the system of the state. And that in the olden days was the king. If you look in Jewish law, you will see that the king had the power to overrule certain halachic criteria when it was required for the well-being of the population. And that meant that therefore the king had the opportunity to say, I will punish this particular person or I will make this or this particular rule, even though the Torah did not ask for it, or perhaps even when it goes against the Torah. But the Torah gave the king the opportunity to do that when he saw that without it, the state would not develop in a healthy way. Now, today we don't have a king anymore, but many rabbinical observations about this say that this is now what the Jewish government, the Israeli government is doing. They took the place of the king, and therefore they are allowed to make certain laws, even when the Torah does not demand them, so that we are able to create a society which is a healthy society. Now, this is a very complicated story mm -hmm. where this one particular authority stop and the other one starts, but that it is built into the Jewish tradition is an 
something which was of tremendous importance and which I think most rabbis are not even aware of, that there is such a concept that the king, or for this reason the government of Israel, is able to go its way. And then you have to sit down around the table and work things out in a way that you get some kind of a compromise. Uh, without compromise it won't work. But there are certain things, like Shabbat, where we should not give in too much because it would undermine the very notion of why we are Jews. Shabbat kept us alive. We did not keep so much Shabbat alive. To do away with that would be a mistake. On the other side, in a democracy, if a person wants to go to the beach, we must give him the opportunity to do so. So the question which we are at the moment asking and discussing is, how do we keep the Jewish Shabbat alive while allowing also these people to do what they like to do? But I think this first of all a matter of education. We need in the also secular Israeli system on school to speak about the tremendous beauty and the power of Shabbat, like so many other beautiful things within the Jewish tradition, which most Israeli kids don't know anything about. And this is a tremendous tragedy, and we better do something about it, because otherwise we're undermining the very reason why we are here in this country after 2,000 years of exile. So as somebody who, myself, I'm speaking for myself, thinks that sh there should be, well, the, the rabbinate here in Israel should be, dismantled, just to a great degree. And uh, if you want to call it separation of church and state, whatever you want to call it should happen. On the other hand, I find myself thinking, and what you say now about the king and about the government, thinking that in certain elements there should be more Torah when it comes to decisions. For example, there are decisions that the government will take, let's say with Gilad Shalit, letting a thousand terrorists out for a, for a soldier. That I would have liked, and I don't know if it happened, but if it did, I wasn't aware of it. I would have liked Jewish sages, wise men of today, of which there are more than a few, to be brought in on that decision. It's not just a state decision. It's not just a political decision. There are, dare I use the word, moral implications here and precedents in Jewish law. And so to some degree, I'm thinking that the institution of the rabbinate needs to change drastically, if not be dismantled. But the institution of the government and I assume when the Torah talks about the king, th they're making the assumption in the Torah that this is a God-fearing king, not, and what you have here, which is an argument someone could make with the Israeli modern government, you have even non-Jews, let alone everybody being, their Judaism being the thing that pushes them through. So it, it's definitely much more complicated today than it, than it would have been then. So what, what would you say about that? I agree that some of the rabbis, some, uh, should have a bigger hand in this and a bigger say in this and that the government should take more uh, their views into account. But remember that not so long ago that actually happened. The last big man to whom the government was listening, the last great rabbi, was Shlomo Gordon, who was uh, first of all the chief rabbi of Israel, who was a tremendous scholar, but also understood quite well and in the army, he was also the chief rabbi of the army, he was both. Um, he was a tremendous scholar. He understood the situation. He understood the situation like the one of Gilad Shalit. He didn't live at the time, but that he would have understood much better. He wrote in great lengths about it. But perhaps I'm a little too critical. We don't have people anymore like Shlomo Gurum. We don't have that wisdom. We don't have that insight. We don't have that knowledge which is required because the big people today who have a tremendous amount of knowledge are more or less separated and um, not being aware about what is happening in our Israeli society. So they can't connect with it. They are disconnected. Mm -hmm. And there are a few exceptions, but these people are very often pushed aside and not really taken serious, but they should be taken serious. But the problem is that uh, this may, may sound quite hard. The uh, ultra-Orthodox have such a power here, but they are being um, led by people who do not fully understand, in my opinion, what actually is going on around or what is taking place within the state of Israel. And we need, therefore, younger 
great scholars to be able to do that. You can't decide on certain matters if you haven't been in the Israeli army. You don't understand what's going on over there. I served in the Israeli army and I've seen it very close by. And uh, as long as you are not part of that world as well and see the incredible moral difficulties the army often is uh, you know, involved in, you cannot really give a halachic ruling about that because you can't learn that from the books. You have to see this also in the field, in, the, in reality. And that is very much what we are missing at this moment. And I can only hope, and I think it will happen, that some young rabbis will suddenly stand up and start to take that position and then get more influential within the government. There is also a problem with the government and it is that religion became politics. And this is a huge, huge problem. And therefore all sorts of different traits of are made which are not very healthy and which gives the Jewish tradition a bad name and therefore also a bad name in the Israeli society for no reason at all. At all. So the rabbinate essentially is still practicing diaspora Juda uh, Judaism and halachot, even though we're in a Zionist state, which is not something they recognize. Years ago, I read um, books by Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz, who you also quote extensively in your book. And I believe it was he that said, and I'm, if, I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that the, cod the codification perhaps where it, we started losing the flexibility that Judaism was supposed to have came... 1800 years ago, when the oral law was written down, when the rabbis were being persecuted and murdered by the Romans, and therefore the Mishnah and later on the Talmud is codified. Um, and that's still one we're in the land, but really not in control. So what what is your opinion on that? Yes, I fully agree with uh, Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz, who had a big influence on my thinking. Uh, we have to decodify, to decodify Jewish law. Uh, because indeed it is an oral tradition and not a written tradition that makes all the difference in the world. Now the only problem which Robert Merkowitz does not speak too much about is how are we able to get back to the oral tradition without the Mishnah, without the codification, where are the sources which we can use to make this to happen again? Because what the Mishnah did, and that's a long time ago, it already started to codify Jewish law. Then the Talmud came and started to give a commentary on the Mishnah by which it made it more flexible. But then again afterwards, Maimonides came and codified it again. So we have an up and down in this situation. And what needs to happen is to go back to the earlier parts really of the times of the Mishnah, we're speaking here about 18 and 1900 years ago, and ask ourselves how did that oral tradition work when it was not yet written down at all, but passed on from one generation to the next. This is not such an easy question to answer for the good reasons that we don't have too many sources to work with. So we have to search within the Talmud, in the Talmud itself, to see if, and there is, some of that stuff to be found over there and work with that. And we have to read between the lines and that we are not doing at this very moment. We just take the Talmud for what it says, and this is what it is. And we don't realize that the Talmud says a lot of things which it did not write down deliberately to keep the oral law alive. And somehow we lost that over the years because of the diaspora experience. But that's what we really need to do and that will take some time to do that. The, the problem with the chief rabbinate here is the chief rabbis are good people, but they are not big enough for this. They get pushed in all corners. It is a political institution. They are not independent. They are dependent on the government. Uh, they are also uh, established by the government. And this has to end. Uh, I call for the complete removal of the chief rabbinate and let the rabbis among themselves find a way without the chief rabbinate to uh, rule on Jewish law. Each one has his own uh, district and where he or they can uh, say what they feel and there must be an acceptance that if a rabbi rules in Haifa about something, no other rabbi can undermine that and starts to say, uh, you know, uh, we will challenge them. They may do that in a good conversation, but not, as has happened a few times now, that they're undermining the very principles of why Jewish law can work on so many different, in so many different situations without giving 
an opportunity that some other people can completely undermine that, which has happened now lately. So it's going back to community or district rabbis. I had read an essay a few years ago that one of the side tragedies of the Holocaust is that the rabbis who were community rabbis, the rabbis who looked for a way to say yes and not no, because it's very easy to say no, you can't do this. But if a woman comes to you and you know her, you're a rabbi, and she's your neighbor, and some milk dropped in her chicken soup, and you know her, and you know that if you say you can't have the chicken soup because we don't mix meat and milk, they're not going to eat that entire week. You're going to figure out a way, if possibly you can, to see what you can do to make it okay. But those rabbis died with their communities in the Holocaust because they were community rabbis and went with their people until the very end. And so that the Torah world, which has really been revived in an outstanding way after the Holocaust, ended up being a more perhaps cut off from people, a more literal one, one that relies on the chumrot, on saying no, because it's just easier to do that. Would you agree with that? Yes, I fully agree with that. The fact is that this indeed has happened, and that is a tremendous tragedy that that happened because rabbis need to be involved in day-to-day -day life of their community members. And at the moment, they are not very much in that situation. And they, I think, very often look over their shoulders. And I think what is happening here, there's a lot of um, pachat, how do you say in English? And fear of what others are saying if I rule differently. And in other words, it's a matter of having the guts to stand up for what you really believe in and you will pay the price so pay the price and not give in every time again when somebody starts to threaten you that uh, you are not uh, kosher enough or whatever it is i know that from my own experience because that's exactly what i do and i pay a price for it and that's absolutely fine and i know and i'm prepared to do that but we therefore need to give a different education to our rabbis uh, it's not just a matter of just learning a lot and knowing a lot. Uh, we need not more textbooks. Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, but we need more text people. That is to say, they have to be an example how they live their lives, how they dare, how they stand out, how they think outside of the box. And if you do that, then you can create a different world. But as long as our Talmudic scholars and our Talmudic schools, the yeshivot, don't teach that, and they don't for most of the time, you will not have a next generation where these young people who are becoming rabbis are able to do that because they don't have the, the instruments, they don't have the kelim, we say in Hebrew, the skills to do this properly. And that's a great, great pity and, again, a tremendous tragedy. But that is what needs to happen. It will ultimately happen because the chief rabbinate is going to disappear. It's a matter of time. And we I will, I say this with certainty because if you run yourself constantly into trouble with the community you are serving and you get more and more opposition at a certain moment, they will make sure that you are no longer do have that power and they will set up their own. Uh, let's say rabbis, and there is already something of that happening, and it will continue to happen more and more. Interestingly, around the whole of the Jewish world, you see an interesting thing. The official Jewish communities, like in England with the United Synagogue, uh, I see this in my home in Holland as well, uh, they are losing more and more young people. But what do these young people do? They start their own communities outside the official framework, built small synagogues which are packed and there are not enough places anymore because young people like to go there and there they do what they want to do and they get a young rabbi to help them out to give them advice and there lies the future not within the official communities not in the mainstream form of jewish tradition and i would add to that that i think that we need a, a post hasidic movement uh, Hasidism has done tremendously well for the Jewish tradition. I don't think it exists today anymore. I don't think that the Hasidim of today understand what this Hasidic tradition in the 18th century was really all about. Because if you start to read their great Hasidic leaders at the time, they wrote the most unusual and highly controversial ideas, which today we could use very well to motivate our young people. But most people don't know about that, except for a very small 
amount of people. And that we have to carry out more, make people more aware of it and create a post Hasidic movement using Hasidic and perhaps also Sephardi uh, attitudes and halachic rulings. And we would be helped on the way quite a lot and things will would go much, much better. Since you brought up Sephardi or maybe the Middle Eastern, uh, the great rabbis from what we call really from the Middle East, um, the Arab world, however you want to put it. It seems that they are, let's say, the late Rav Ovad Yosef, perhaps a little, and I hate to use less lenient because in our parlance of today, that means not as religious, um, but more open to different ideas or more open to going back to ideas that were there and reviving them than the Ashkenazi rabbis, the more European or Western world rabbis. Is that true? Yes, that is definitely true. If you start to read, for example, their responsa written by the Ashkenazi rabbis, the great halachic works they wrote, and you compare them to the Sephardim, you see a tremendous difference in attitude. And that has a lot to do with the sociological conditions under which they lived. The Ashkenazi community lived in a very... Uh, in a world of tremendous animosity against the Jews, Sephardim actually experienced that much less. They were more open. They also lived in the sun, in the, which is an optimistic uh, way and experience. The Ashkenazim lived in darkness, literally in darkness with snow and ice. That creates a certain mentality and that reflects itself in the responsa. So you have had in the Sephardi world, there have some been some... Uh, extremely interesting, highly lenient rabbis who understood their community well, had an, a certain optimism and a certain f- way of looking to all this from a musical perspective, saw the great opportunities there and actually used them well in the Ashkenazi community. That happened very little. And there is a tremendous difference here. There was a rabbi here, the chief rabbi of Haifa. He was called Yosef Mashash. Very famous man. If you read the stuff which he wrote as halachic responses to questions, you wouldn't believe your eyes what he permitted, how he was lenient about many, many matters, which I don't think any Ashkenazi rabbi would even dare to do. But he had all the knowledge in the world and proved this point very well. But above all, it was an attitude which he had. He had an optimistic view of life. He believed in the Jews. He believed that we have to make the Jewish tradition as attractive as as possible. Don't put all sort of special humrot uh, on them, but be as lenient as you can, but be also very spiritual. So it is not a matter that when you're lenient, you're less religious. I would say say the reverse. It is being more flexible means to say you, you live in the presence of God, and that in itself is a tremendous, great, optimistic, and fantastic experience. And if you live it that way, then you're not afraid to be lenient because it goes hand in hand. I like what you said about weather, um, the weather outside affecting the disposition and how, what people wrote. I think that comes from your background in Holland in the very short winter days, maybe. <laughs> your childhood spent in a cold place perhaps made you realize that it affects that it affects mood. And that, you know, we've talked in Israel, the Ashkenazi, Sephardi differences, and now you have the so-called mixed marriages of Ashkenazim and Sephardim, but decades ago you wouldn't have had that. And it's a shame a, a, I think it's terrible, and I'm speaking as 100% Ashkenazi, that the narrative of what happened here is very much, and the history is very much written by the Ashkenazim, and it's really very, um, it's it's wrong, and it's also, uh, it just puts down what the Jews that lived here for so long and the Jews from the area, but we could use that, that tremendous knowledge, which then leads to leniency through the knowledge and the looking to make it happy. Um so many, both in my own home and in, in the home of many of my friends, we see that our children are not as happy with Judaism and with the way of, of a Jewish life, a traditional Jewish life, as we have raised them to be and would like them to be. And um, I think some of what they're saying, they're thinking Judaism isn't answering them. But what you're saying is the answers here for a happy Judaism, for a mystical, and I, well, I don't know if mystical is the right word, but it's not just laws. It's not just do this. What happened to the spirit of Judaism? Yeah. First of all, I think that all the laws are really musical notes on which you have to 
play your own music. They were not given just to follow them up, but you have to lift them. You have to feel them in your very bones. The problem is that our children are taking the Jewish tradition much too much for granted because they never had to fight for it. We brought that to them. We educated that, them in that. We brought them to religious schools. But we must understand that we are paying a price for that. And that is if you don't have to fight for it, and you get it all on a silver plate, you can never, never be as committed as you and I am. Why? Because you had to fight for it and I had to fight for it. And the fighting, I would even say, the waging war about this is the ultimate way. You can't uh, inherit religion from your parents. You can't inherit it from your teachers. All what you can do is to give them the knowledge, but they have to fight for it and they have to decide for it whether or not they want to go for it. And the biggest problem indeed is today that when they ask very good questions, they don't get answers because or the rabbis don't know the answers or they don't want to give the answers for whatever reason and suddenly everything becomes heresy when in fact it is not at all. And the teacher needs to learn how to get into the brain and in the heart of the te- of the pupil to understand what is going on and they have not learned to do that because they themselves never experienced this because they also got from came from a religious home and everything is taken for granted this is always the problem with any kind of religion this is in the christian world the half deal also the case and it's a pity you have to fight for your religion you have to discover it on your own otherwise you will not understand the beauty behind it and therefore you won't be as committed so every generation needs to take on Judaism on their own? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is no other way. It is not a merit matter of just inheritance. You can, as I said before, you can inherit it from your parents and then you have to say, does it speak to me? If it does not speak to me, what am I missing? You don't walk out. You start to refight for it and rediscover it. And then you will suddenly see that there are things going on there which you have never heard about, your parents perhaps have never heard about, but which are exactly the responses to what you are looking for. uh, Reinhold Niebuhr was one of the great Protestant thinkers who used to say, there is nothing more um, irrelevant than an answer to a question nobody asks. And that is a very important observation. If you learn only answers, and you don't understand that it has to be introduced by a question, you can't appreciate the answer. Judaism is an answer to the huge questions of human existence. But if you never ask the questions, what is human existence? What does it mean that I'm here? What is the whole purpose of the Jewish people, of mankind, of the universe? And then you get an answer, then you miss the answer because you don't understand what the answer is actually responding to. Then the answer is meaningless. So in your book, you talk about how the Torah was actually the most rebellious book possibly ever, but definitely for its time. So here we are practicing a Judaism now that tends to be very conformist. And if you step out of the lines, you're not considered religious, or this one won't marry you, or whatever it is, you can't get into the right schools, whatever it is. And as a result, too many people are just saying, the heck with this, I'm out of here. This is nothing I want to live. But you're saying that from the very core We were supposed to be rebelling against everything around us and not conforming. Yes, that's definitely true. I mean, when, as we see in the Torah itself in the earlier days, but we see it today as well, there are so many things wrong about this world, then the whole purpose of being Jewish is to rebel against this, to object against it, to protest against it. But what are we doing? We are telling our children to be quiet. They're not allowed to rebel. They're not allowed to ask questions. And therefore, we are missing the whole boat of what this is all about. And that has to be reinstituted in our educational system, but also at home. You have to tell your children, ask whatever you like to ask. If I don't know the answer, let's find it together. And let's see what the answer could be. But we are not doing that. We have dogmatized the Jewish tradition to such an extent that it now became a matter of, or you believe it or you don't believe it. 
The truth about it is that every religious Jew sometimes has his doubts, as much as every secular Jew has his doubts if secularity is really the answer to the to his problems. The answer is you can only fight for it and work for it and try it and, and redo it again. You fall, you stand up again, you will try once more. This is the only way how this works. And we are missing that. And that is a terrible tragedy as well. Well, maybe to some degree we're victims of success, meaning that when we started off 3,800 years ago, let's say with Abraham and later with the Torah, the, what the Torah is saying, what morality is and should be, is completely against the idol worship and the immorality of the world at the time. But if you look at what's called the Western mores of today, they're more or less, more or less, Torah mores, not so much because of us, but actually ironically because of the Christians who took right, some of the Bible and spread it around the world vis-a-vis -vis the missionizing, which we didn't do. So maybe we don't, if, if we're, if the world is doing what we had suggested that we do, so there's, is there a reason here to rebel anymore? Yes, the reason is because the world has accepted many of the moral values of the Torah, but for a good part of the time, don't live by it at all. There's a difference between what is in the books and what is actually happening in the streets. The streets don't show this, so therefore we need, again, to protest against what is happening outside our homes on so many different levels. There are terrible things taking place, people getting murdered, uh, you know, an enormous amount of... Uh, uh, situations in which people can't live a normal life because of other people. We have it all very nicely written up in our books and in our legal systems, but when it comes to what we call in Hebrew halacha say how it really works, there's still a big difference between what it says in the book and what we are actually doing out there. And that is the reason why we need to continue to fight and to protest against that. But we're not doing that. We basically gave in to a lot of things and say oh, it can't be helped. It can't be happen. It can't be helped. It is too late now. We can't do anything more about it. That's the wrong philosophy from a Jewish perspective. I think what the world, the Western world, considers its freedoms has actually brought upon it a lot of misery and a lot of unhappiness and divorces and suicides and and with all the freedom to choose, how come people are less happy than they used to be? Because that is not at all freedom. Freedom doesn't mean to say that you can do whatever you like to do. Freedom is when you decide to do what you ought to do. That is a freedom. That is a real freedom. It is on a moral level where we are able to show our freedom. But most people don't realize that at all. They think you are free the moment you can do whatever you like to do. This is basically giving in most of the time to your own desires and not at all being free, but being captured by lower uh, feelings which we have and where we want to have our own way and we are thinking more about ourselves than we think about our fellow man. That's not freedom. Freedom is exactly the reverse. What I ought to do, how I can morally grow, how I can build myself, that is real freedom. The great philosophers in the non-Jewish world also have said that, but they were not able to send that message or were not able to make that message to convert into reality within that world. And we Jews are lately not doing much of that either, therefore including religious Jews. We have brought the whole of the Jewish tradition back to Shabbat, to eating kosher, and a few more things, but we are not speaking about the great moral uh, implications of the Torah, which are just as valuable today and relative today as they were in the past. I meet many people who, as you, you said it so well in your book, there are Jewish non-Jews and there are non-Jewish Jews, meaning Someone was born of a Jewish mother, but they don't have, I don't know if you want to call it a Jewish soul, or that's not what motivates them. And I have met, as I'm sure you have also, many people who wouldn't be considered halachically Jews, yet they, they get it. They, they have that Jewish soul. Some of them, and some of my listeners might count themselves among that, think sometimes about actually coming into the Jewish world. One of the things that you talk about extensively in your book, and it's a huge issue here in Israel, is conversion. And getting back to Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz, there were two things that he said were not the symbol of justice, which is what Judaism is all about. And if I recall correctly, one of them is the status of Algunot, which we don't have time to talk about, the, women, the chained women who are in marriages where the husband has disappeared, either intentionally or not, and her status and conversion. The conversion was never supposed to be this difficult. And we have a situation here in Israel where we have many people who, because of the law of return, was the, 
the reverse of what the Nazis said, meaning you could come and live in Israel if only one grandparent was Jewish, but that doesn't always sync with what the halakha says, which it has to be from the mother. So what, what would you say to do about that? Well, we have literally hundreds of thousands of Israelis now who would like to join the Jewish people, but don't necessarily want to lead an Orthodox lifestyle. And this is a huge issue. What, we, what are your suggestions on that? I think there's a uh, very good solution to this, given by the first chief rabbi, the first Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel, R- Rabbi Ben-Zion Uziel, one of the great, great halachic authorities at the time, who said that any child who comes to Israel from a mixed marriage or a grandparent who's Jewish, while the child itself is not Jewish, we should convert them even when they don't want to live an orthodox Jewish life. As long as they want to be part of us, they are still children of us. He calls them Zira Israel. They are from the seed of Israel. Therefore, they are part of our family. And therefore, we must not stand in the way to make it as easy as possible for them to do the giur, to convert, uh, in according to orthodox law, no doubt, And then to say to them, listen here, we would very much like you to keep Shabbat, observe Shabbat, eat kosher, and so on. And uh, it is up to you to decide on that. But be part of us. Be be part of us. Don't We won't leave you outside. But the chief rabbi, rabbi Nathan Israel is not doing anything of this. And therefore, it creates problems. Not only we have 400,000 Russian uh, people here who are halachically not Jewish, but have Jewish uh, forefathers. If we don't convert these people... When they want, not all of them want, but those who want but don't want to observe every law, let's say, we will have in another few years 600,000 of them because they will marry our children and there will be more people who are logically not Jewish. We cannot afford anything like that in a state of Israel. And therefore, and that was also Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz's point of view, make it as easy as possible for these people, but let them convert so that they are becoming full part of our nation, halachically speaking, absolutely fine, and let's not stand in their way. And there is one of the biggest blunders of the chief rabbinate here is that it is not prepared to go along with this ruling of Rabbi Uziel and later of Rabbi Berkowitz. Well, as a result, you have reform and conservative conversions then where people feel that they're Jewish, and I've met many, but wouldn't be accepted here as Jews. Yes, this is a great pity. What we need to do is, and to speak to the reform and the conservative and say, listen here, if you have people who want to convert, we will, the Orthodox, convert them for you so that we can also accept them, even when they don't keep everything as we would like them to keep, because they are part of our nation. They want to be part of our nation, and they live in the state of Israel. Why shouldn't they become Jewish? So we don't have to accept the reform and conservative for uh, uh, conversion, if we say to them, we will do it for you and do us a favor, let us do it. Why? So that all of us agree that they are Jewish. Mm-hmm. Um, one sec, I'm gonna, this will have to be cut out. 47. There are certain sentences in your book that actually brought me to tears, that just like popped out at me. And I have to say, that despite the, the depth of this conversation to all my listeners, you need to read the book because it, it, there are so many different topics. Every essay that's compiled here, and there are dozens of essays compiled here, can stand really maybe as a book on, on, on its own. So this interview is not doing the book justice. But for example, the quest for certainty paralyzes the search for meaning. It took me to get to the age that I'm on to realize that my life was about the journey not about getting necessarily somewhere. And the way that you frame Judaism is the same thing, that it's not just to do it, just to do it, but it's, it's, the, it's looking for the meaning in what we're doing that seems to have been taken out. Yes, this is true. And I, in this statement or this sentence you just uh, read, my, the point which I'm making is you don't have to be certain about every belief. What you have to do is you have to try to see what it means. But you can only do that when you doubt. Certainty is great, but doubt gives you an education. 
if not for doubt, we wouldn't be able to understand the Jewish tradition in the way we need to do it. Because constantly when we question things and we say, why should this be true? We will go deeper and we'll understand better what the Jewish tradition is trying to say to us. So this certainty is a kind of an obsession with people, religious and also secular certainty, because that's also there. This is not the way how you run your life. As you said very correctly, it is the road which we travel. It is not the point where we arrive. We probably will never arrive. It doesn't matter. It is the road on which we travel, which is so important. So one day I am a little bit more sure about something. The next day I may be a little less sure about it. It doesn't matter at all. What keeps us together is no doubt the halacha, which says, okay, even when you're not sure, try to walk this walk, try to do what you are asked to do. It gives you a framework. It keeps you a, within a certain way of thinking, which is healthy. But keep on doubting and keep on asking questions by all means. The moment we stop that, we stop the traveling, we stop the journey. And that's the worst of all things. You have a chapter where you talk about taking off your kippah, meaning that you wear the kippah, and then you ign then it's you don't think about it anymore. You tell it. It's well, I, in short, yes, I wrote this, and I'm very pleased that I wrote this. Uh, lots of people were very upset with me when I wrote this. Um, but the point which I was making is that when I started to become a little religious, I never walked with a kippah on my head, but when I started to get involved in this a little bit, in a non-Jewish school, I used to put on my kippah, my yarmulke, and I would eat. And I remember I was 14, 15 years old, uh, that this was an incredible experience because something happened to me. The moment I put this little thing on my head, I got a feeling like, you know, I am living in the presence of God. And that's the reason why I put this little thing on to remind me that there's somebody above me. So it was always a tremendous experience. It was a religious experience. There's no other word for it. And I was always looking for the next time when I would eat, not so much of the food, but because of the <laughs> fact that I could put it this and have this experience again. And then what happens is that over the years, I got more religiously involved. And one day I decided to walk around with the kippah, thinking that when I would do that, I would have the experience all the time. And exactly the opposite happened. Because I got so used to the kippah that it doesn't speak anymore to me. It doesn't give me the religious experience anymore. So therefore, in this article, in this essay, I asked the question, perhaps I should take it off again. S why? So that when I put it on again, I have the experience again. Now, how am I going to explain to my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren when they see their grandfather walking around without a kippah, they won't understand why I do that. And they probably will think, well, he's getting less and less religious. The truth about it is that I would like them to understand I'm getting more religious because I'm taking it off. I haven't found a solution to this problem. <laughs> well, what I try and do is give myself experiences where I feel that I'll meet God. So for me, as my listeners know, it's going to places in, places in nature. It's going to Costa Rica, which I did a couple of years ago. It's having other situations where I feel Hashem is right there, where it's this magnificent world that he made me a part of. I haven't a clue as to what's really going on, but I know that he's in charge and I know that he loves me and I know that he believes in me and the gifts that he's given me and, and my choosing what to do every single day. And so it's not the same as the kippah, at least uh, maybe it's different for women anyway. But I think we can all do that. We can all find ways. We can all put ourselves in situations that challenge us to find the meaning in what's going on, even a mundane situation, or even still eating food but making sure to make a bracha over it and to say, wow, this orange is incredible, which we can do here in Israel because the food really is outstanding. So it can be a religious experience to eat. Yes, I think the whole point of religion uh, and not only the Jewish tradition, but first of all, is to teach us how to live in amazement, to live in wonder. I think this is one of the most important things of never getting used to anything. That whenever I see a bird flying by, or I see a flower, or when I go to Costa Rica, or wherever it is, it can be just under my nose, that I suddenly realize this is absolutely wondrous. 
this is totally amazing. Uh, the sun goes up in the morning and goes under in the evening. Nobody has ever explained this. No science has ever explained it. It only explains what happens, but it does not explain why it happens. These are all wondrous moments. And that's the reason why we Jews make a bracha, a blessing on everything and anything, because a blessing is really saying, wow, unbelievable. And we translate that in Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed is God who created this or created that. But that is one of the main functions of the halacha, to make us to come, uh, become aware of living, of having to live in amazement. The problem is that the conformity is standing in the way. And therefore we have to re-educate ourselves how to live with this halacha and our children as well, that they see this as the very instrument, the very way by which I get more and more amazed about this mysterious place called the world and the universe, for which we really have no explanation whatsoever. And, and therefore religion is of tremendous importance. Secularism, secularism is something which really has done a terrible job in the sense of making us to think that things are normal. The truth about it is everything is abnormal. Abnormal in the sense it cannot be explained, it is beyond us, and therefore it is beautiful. Can anybody explain me why music of Mozart, Beethoven, or Paganini is beautiful? I can't explain that. I can't explain, can't explain to you why a flower is beautiful, but I know one thing, it is beautiful. It is something which tells us from within that something about it touches our soul, and that is what this religion should try to educate us in. So you say that maybe we should go back to some kind of prophetic Judaism, like that time, where it was, that was pre-codification, if we go into the Bible times. It was a very different kind of Judaism that we have today. Yes, uh, I am very much are in favor of what I call prophetic Judaism or prophetic halacha. Uh, I mentioned that also in the book, uh, which means to say that the prophets were constantly busy fighting with God about all sorts of matters, you know, not making it easy for God either to live with these fellows. And by doing that, they brought a dimension of religiosity into the conversation, which otherwise would have been left out. And after the prophets and their days came to an end, what you see, you see this also in the response of the rabbis, they never speak anymore about the experience of God. They only try to solve a halachic problem. I'm arguing in one of the articles that if you want to solve a halachic problem, you first need to listen to Beethoven or to Mozart. You first have to have a feeling there's something going on in this world which music no doubt can achieve that I realize I'm living in the presence of God and then I can rule on a particular halachic problem. But we're not doing that. So therefore it becomes very academic and it speaks to our minds, but it no longer speaks to our hearts and our children quite well understand that this is the big failure here. Yeah. And then they go to India or they go to try out ashrams or drugs or whatever it is to look for that wow in other places when they really have it at home. Yes, this is absolutely true. Uh, the uh, great spiritual leader, I forgot his name, uh, the Dalai Lama was once here many years ago in Tel Aviv, and there were thousands of people to come to listen to him. I was not there, but I heard this afterwards, and he said, why are you Jews coming to me to listen to my wisdom? You have it yourself. I came here to listen to you, not that you should listen to me, because you have all the different aspects of religion, which is exactly what I'm teaching in my religion or my philosophy, but there's no need at all to go to India. You have it in Tel Aviv. Why are you coming to us? This is a very profound question, which I think Israelis need to respond to. So how do we do this to get to the practicalities? And, and I, I really am enc encouraging all my listeners, Jews and non-Jews, Jewish Laws, Rebellion, a Plea for Religious Authenticity and Halachic Courage by Rabbi Nathan Lopez Cardoza. But on a practical level, how do we train teachers or how do we, even if skipping the level of teachers, how do we get to the young Jews or to Jews in general, any age, to understand that, to, to not dump the Judaism, but to understand that the Judaism that they think is Judaism is not 
the full Judaism, to get more interested because so many of them get so disgusted or so turned off that they don't even, they're done. They're done. How do we draw them back in? This is not an easy question to answer. It requires a whole different kind of education at home, in school, wherever we go. And I would say that the first important step is to make our young people aware of the mysterious situation in which we live, in the incredible mystery and beauty of our lives, and the complexity of it, but the beauty's full sight of it, and to teach them that only when you have a feeling for this, when you, again coming back to music, you listen to music and you realize that something is happening within you, and then to show how the Jewish tradition responds to that and activates this and makes this to happen within our own souls, there's a possibility of getting these people back to the Jewish tradition. But just learning with them a Mishnah or even a piece of the Talmud is not going to work here. And this is the big mistake which many teachers are making. They believe that if I learn one more Mishnah or one piece more of the Talmud, it is going to make that. No, you have to use the Talmud to show them what and how do you experience this amazement? Because that's really what the Talmud is all about. It constantly is busy with trivialities, teaching us that there is no such thing in this world as trivialities. It all happens in the presence of God. If it happens in the presence of God, how can it be trivial? If I do a, make a little step, I open my fridge on Shabbat, and for a moment I have to think if I'm allowed to do this, yes or no, or why I'm not allowed to step in a car or use my computer, I need to ask, what is the purpose behind it? What is the ideology behind it? What is the philosophy behind it? How does it teach me to become a better Jew and a better human being? And that you can do if you have that background and use the Talmud as the way in which you can develop this within the mind and the hearts of these young people. But today, the way how we learn and we teach the Talmud, we are not doing anything of that. So obviously young people are walking out and say, what has this to do with me? It is not even relevant to my life. I'm learning about a cow, which is goring an other cow, you know, an ox, whatever it is. What has this to do with my life? So, or you translate that in terms of today and you show them that there's a deep message there and a mission there, only then it will work. And here speaking about mission, it is important to mention something else as well. The Jews have a mission. The only trouble is that they lost the mission. The mission is that we have to inspire the rest of the world, that we are there, we are called the chosen people, which does not mean to say that we can say we are better than anybody else, but we are a little bit the teachers and the prophets of this world, and we care about mankind and not only about the Jewish people in Israel or outside Israel. But nearly nobody discusses this in the classroom. There's a few exceptions. So the children are asking, why should I live this life? I want to have meaning in my life, and I don't get it from the Jewish tradition. Obviously, they walk out. I would also walk out under those conditions. But there's no need for it, because if we would teach this differently and would tell them we have a mission in this world, and this is not an easy one to be the chosen people. We have to be an example. We have to inspire. Then there is a possibility that the child says, wow, I would like to be part of this. But that needs a lot of change, a radical change is in Jewish education, which we are still away from. Somewhere. So are you educating rabbis, you personally? Are there other rabbis who may not want to be named? I'm hoping that there's a cadre of like 150,000 rabbis just like you that haven't come out yet, but, but will any minute. Am I kidding myself? I don't know if they are there. I know there are some there who very much think like I do and feel like I do. Um, what it is going to take is uh, the yeshiva world where we educate the rabbis will have to educate differently. And this can be done. It's not so difficult. There are beautiful books today being written by some very big people. Besides Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz, if you think about Jonathan Sachs, the mm -hmm. former chief rabbi of England, and some other people who have written extremely good books explaining what the Jewish tradition stands for. I tell you an interesting thing. I get Friday night often, Pachorei Yeshiva, Yeshiva students coming at my table. 
and I asked them, how long have you been learning in yeshiva? So they say five years, four years. So how many tractates of the Talmud did you learn? And they tell me what. Then I say, okay, I have a question for you. If a non-Jewish person or a Jew who is not religious comes to you and asks you, why are you religious? What would you answer? 99% does not know to answer that question. And then I say, how can it be that you've learned all these texts and you've been sitting on these texts for years and you can't answer that question? Don't you think there's something wrong here? And then they say, which is true, the teachers never spoke with us about these matters. And then I go to the teachers and I ask them, have you ever thought about that? And then the answer normally is, I neither have ever thought about this. It is only about the strict halakha and it is not about the experience. It is not about the feeling that I live in the presence of God. So what do you want from these kids? How are you going to educate them? On the end, they will know the whole Talmud and they will not understand a word about the Jewish tradition because you missed the boat. It's all a matter in the first place of education. And if the school doesn't do it, at least the parents at home should do that. Read good stuff and discuss that at the Shabbat table or in the weekday. Ask your child, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Don't we have a mission in this world? Is it not fantastic to be Jewish? And then you slowly but surely are able to build that attitude. Not to mention saying, I don't know. I think a lot of us are afraid to say, I don't know. As parents, why is the sky blue? All the questions our children throw at us. It's okay to say, I don't know. That's just the way Hashem did it. Yes. I did something else with my children when my children asked me questions which I didn't know the answer on, or they were too young to understand the question, the answer. I said to them, I will write, I have an exercise book. I write these questions down. I'll come back to you. Or when you're older, or when I found the answer. And that's what I did. And it worked. Maybe some of them found the answer for you? And no doubt. I learned a lot from my children. Absolutely. Baruch Hashem. Okay, I could sit here for hours and talk to you, but I'm not going to do that. Um, thank you so much. i very honored that you spend this time with me. And once again, everybody, is it available on Amazon yet? And if Okay, two weeks' time for those of you who are listening in North America and can't make a move without Amazon, speaking of consumerism, uh, you'll be able to find the book, Jewish Law as Rebellion, a Plea for Religious Authenticity and Halachic Courage um, by Rabbi Natan Lopez Cordoza. It is available in Israel, so if you're lucky enough to be here, you can find it. Is it only in English? In the moment, it is only in English, but we are working on a Hebrew translation, and it may be get translated in more languages I don't know yet. We'll look for that. And I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, ex express some of my thoughts here. Yeah, we didn't even begin to get into to what is in the book and what are in your other essays. And um, thank you, because I'm leaving here full of hope, um, because Judaism is an incredible way of life, and Hashem is present in all our lives. And it's too important to let it go. And we can't do that. None of us can do that, no matter where we're sitting. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Again, Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. And thank you to Tabitha and to Ben. And write to me. I'm always happy to hear your comments. Eve at the Land of